Hello guys and welcome to Daddy Share Space. So today I wanted to go over the TSV 60 and do some cuts. I was wrestling around just kind of, well, this is a modular shop and since it's a modular shop, I'm always moving things around. Most of the carts and stuff in here are on wheels. So I'm always rearranging things so that it, you know, works out. So I had to move a whole bunch of things to pull out this piece of melamine and the actual foam that's underneath here to get it up here to cut. Well, it's almost 8 p.m. and uh, I realized that I was not gonna be able to get around to do that video today. So instead, what I did was I pulled out the rails that I have, well, some of the rails that I have, festival rails rather, and I pulled out the actual my old festival track saws so and I have them all laid out here and basically what I have here I have two uh, three 1400 rails one of them is the LR32 rail because I have the LR32 system I have three of the FSK rails it comes in 250 420 and what is the other one 670 in size this is the TS-75, 75 millimeter cut depth. This is the HKC-55, corded or cordless rather. This here is the TSC-55KEB. And then over here, I have the TSC-55REB, which I actually purchased that particular tool used. And when I purchased that one, I actually purchased my C-18 drill as well from the same uh, guy who was selling both. So, Basically, I'm just, you know, sharing a little bit here. So this 1900 rail that I'm pointing to, this is the rail that I use with my TS-75. So I bought this rail specifically for this one. Now this newer 1900 rail that I have here, I purchased that one and that's my cross cut rail for my MFT. Because my MFT is four foot by eight foot, I was unable to use the 55 millimeter rail with the benchdogs.co.uk hinge so I had to use the 75 millimeter rail to get across now theoretically I could actually cut it down to make it fit because it's it overhangs on both sides but I didn't want to alter the rail from factory so I left it as it is all the way on the end there I have the FS 3000 rail uh, I believe that rail is 118 inches in length so the 1400s I believe are 55 the 1900s are 75 and this the only rail that I have configured to my Festool REB saw is an 800 rail the 800 rail I believe let me see here I also have this rail over here this one is on my MFT. This is a 1080 rail. So I have a 1080 rail on the MFT, an 800 rail over there for shorter cross cutting. And the TS75 and the TSC55 REB both have the 2.2 curved blades. So it's a possibility that I could get away with interchanging those two. However, an 800 rail, uh, 800, uh, FS800 rail is not going to really give you much cut room using the TS-75. I do have two new rails in the shop that I haven't opened yet. One of them here is an LR32 rail, which is another 55 millimeter, or 55, I keep saying millimeter, 55 inch rail. That's the rail that they gave me when I bought my TSV-60 saw. Oh, no, no. This is the rail that they gave me when I bought my TS-60 saw. I bought it in the kit. I think they may have made a mistake by giving me the, the actual LR32 rail, but it is what it is. They make a 95 inch LR32 rail, which is, I don't know, it's probably close to $400, but with the two 55s, I could put them together if I wanted to do a longer cabinet with shelf pin holes or whatever, that's a possibility. The other rail that I have is this 1900 rail. I imagine it's probably going to be a regular 1900, not the newer model with the actual cutouts. This is the one that came with the TSV 
saw. Right here, I got the TSVK60. And then here, I have the TS60 saw. So I just kind of pulled those out. And you can see them in relationship to the other saws that I have out here. Now, the only festival saw that I don't have is the Corded 55. The newer model, and I don't have the older one either. So here's the TS60. Of course, corded. And then here, V60. This over here for now. Now, what I'm going to do, and I think I'm going to do this tomorrow, since I have the piece of melamine up here on the table, I'm going to leave it here. And then my goal is to, I'm going to, I'm going to exclude this FSK saw. That's not going to be part of the test. But what I'm going to do is probably do cross cuts on this piece of melamine. It was like $43 from the Home Depot. And look at each cut and compare them. But before I do that, so it may not actually happen tomorrow, before I do that, I'm gonna take this TSV60, I'm going to use a straight edge like this here and put it on the melamine. And I'm just gonna put the frame of the saw up against it, the plate, and go across and try to dial in. I'm going to try to dial in the actual. Uh, we'll see where my scoring blade is in relationship to the regular blade. Once I figure out where they are in relationship one to another, then I'm going to adjust it accordingly. And then I'll open this rail when I feel comfortable and marry the TSV60 to this rail. And as I said before, I'm, or as I said in the previous video, I'm going to use my wife's label maker and put a label on this one so that I know that it's for the TSV60. Someone uh, mentioned in one of the comments that basically the TS60, which is this saw here, and the TSV60 don't have the same cut line. I'm going to take a look at that. And then I, I just want to see what all of these saws do, with the exception of the HKC, on melamine, just to see if the scoring cut is actually gonna be a substantial difference. And that'll probably be an individual video by itself, but then I'm gonna follow that up with my Makita, my DeWalt, and I think that's all that I have. And I'll do the same thing. I'll make a cut with these uh, on this piece of melamine just to compare all the different types of cut. Now, all of these saws have the stock blade in place, so I'm not going to be changing out to any kind of special blade as of today. I don't have any. I think I have a rip blade for this TS-75, but I don't have any of the other blades for any of the saws, so I won't be doing that. Something else that I kind of wanted to talk about while I have this out, this is just kind of like more of a vlog style video, is if having multiple rails can be difficult to store however it is very helpful it's obviously easiest if you only have one track saw because then you don't have to worry about which saw you use on which rail and the the saw that i'm using the most obviously i have not really used the ts v60 well i haven't used the ts v60 at all yet but the ts60 i've used it the least out of all the saws the main saw that I use is this TSC55 saw. And in my video, when I use this TS60 KEB, I said that the TSC55 KEB, it just seems to just kind of like just cut through the material and it seemed like there was little to absolutely no resistance. Whereas the TS75 and the TS60 seemed to, it was almost like a, like the motor had some kind of variability to it and using the sys table saw it felt like this cordless saw i mean it felt like you know as i was putting the 
plywood through it. It just was just cutting effortlessly. I didn't feel the variability. It just seemed to rev up the speed and maintain its speed all the way through the workpiece. So if you had a question about how the actual table saw cuts, that's how you know it was working for me. Now, as many of you guys know, I'm a DIY type of guy. And I've seen a couple videos online where people would be doing these creative things about changing their position in their shop or in their video, which brought a little bit of interest. Now, when I talk about DIY, I'm not just talking about woodworking and tools. I built my own computers. Well, I haven't built one in a long time, but I built my own computers. I obviously work on my vehicles. I'm trying to learn how to do lawn care, though I'm failing at it horribly. There will be an update video on how bad that's going. And just other things, you know, whatever I can get my hands on to DIY, I'm into it. I actually had a Surface Pro 4 where the battery actually started swelling. And I basically, took it apart. I bought one of those iFixit kits, the one that's for a repair guy. It's probably like 300 something dollars. And I went through and I actually took that thing apart and I upgraded the hard drive from a 256 up to one terabyte and replaced the battery. And I ended up having to replace the screen because I damaged the screen when I took it out. And I ended up having to buy two screens and even when I fully repaired it and got it all back together, I couldn't get the center part of the screen to work anymore, but the sides were still, the touch screen still worked. However, as a, just a straight up laptop, it worked perfectly fine. No issues whatsoever. So those are things that, you know, I'm into doing is, you know, just tinkering with stuff and just trying to figure things out. I, you know, really take a lot of pride in trying to learn how to fix things. So you've seen my sustainer saw, which is over here to my right. This is my Dwarf Flexpo table saw. I've had this for quite a while. It's not the only battery power saw that I have in the shop, but it is a, sh a saw that I'm actually going to be running up against this, this Festool saw. So it runs on one Flexpo battery. Power-wise, it seems to be pretty sufficient. And I have a lot of flexible batteries, so I haven't had any issues with runtime on it because I can keep cycling out the batteries. The one benefit to this particular saw is I do have the actual, I have the flexible miter saw as well. It runs on two flexible batteries and it also has an adapter to where you could actually plug it into the wall so you could use it as an uh, AC powered machine. However, I did see a gentleman on YouTube who basically had his motor go out twice on this particular saw and he was using the actual adapter. I have only used the adapter one time just to test it out but I don't use it. I still have it here, but I don't use it. And he was told after getting his saw repaired for the second time, and I think the motor was like 300 and some dollars, um, not to use it anymore. So, and the newer model of this particular saw no longer has two batteries, and of course there's no adapter. When this particular flexible saw came out, they were basically talking about making an AC adapter for this, but it never came to market, which is unfortunate. I thought that would be cool to actually have a saw that you can use battery power and then turn around and use it corded. There is a Metabo saw though that has that feature. And honestly, it's crazy. Before I picked up this Festo saw, I actually considered getting that. Here I have my M18 Milwaukee table saw. I actually built a little enclosure for it. And the one thing that I like about this particular saw is it does have the ability to accept a dado cut. Both the Festool and the DeWalt saws do not accept the dado cut. So that is one of the benefits of this M12 or M18 saw. This is the saw. So once I bought the Festool saw, I was actually talking to someone and because I'm considering selling my DeWalt Flexful. Not 100% sure if I'm going to do it, but I was considering it. One of the reasons why I've kind of changed my mind about possibly selling it is. So this here is my m12 or m18 12 inch miter saw and i have the m18 table saw obviously i was going to keep both of these and then keep the fest tool as well and possibly sell my dewalt i was going to be able to get rid of the flex fold miter saw and then also the dewalt table saw however the problem that i ran into was the other day well, a little bit ago, I went to use the saw and then I noticed that the electronic brake stopped working. And then 
I didn't really pay much attention to it. My wife came out in the garage. She was like, you know, I kind of smell something burning. Well, I didn't really take mo any mind to it because I didn't smell anything. But then I came out maybe a week or so later and I was using this saw. Back here in this area right here, I saw some kind of a spark or flame. And basically the stall started to smell like it was burning. Now it still worked, but now I'm feeling kind of sketchy about this saw. So it kind of has me in the mindset of maybe keeping the DeWalt and maybe, you know, I wouldn't sell this saw to someone not in that condition. However, it does give me pause about keeping this particular miter saw. And it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're gonna run two platforms as I was planning on doing to have to, to keep the DeWalt flex bolt miter saw and then keep the Milwaukee table saw. I mean, if you're gonna do that, you might as well keep them all. Right here I have my Milwaukee seven and a quarter miter saw. This is the one that I was gonna replace. I was gonna get the Capex 60 to replace this particular saw. Now, the reason why I wanted to pick up the KS60 was because they actually come with, well, you can buy that mobile stand that Festool makes and it also has the wings that you can add on which is super pricey like if you buy the saw and everything it's like $2,500 however it gives you the ability to give the repeatable cuts and it's mobile which is a lot better than building a regular miter station now you can see just from the little pieces of the garage that I've shown it's a pretty full space so in the long run I may end up getting rid of a lot of my more fixed furniture and just using things like my MFT, which I have here, I saw a product that Festool makes, it's, I think it's called the STM or something like that, and it's a folding cutting station. And if I was to actually remove this table and put it on the ground and get rid of the rolling base, obviously the legs fold out, that STM actually could fit, it folds up and can fit underneath the Festool MFT. And so it actually folds up to be pretty compact. This table itself, as long as I take off the actual hardware, can actually just kind of go up against the wall. So one of the things that I realized in the Festival system is they really focus on that whole mobility in their work. You got all these sustainers here that you could utilize to kind of store things and kind of carry them from place to place. They got the different rolling carts. You've got that actual, the, the table saw rolling cart and all of these things, which would make it more easy or convenient to just kind of put all of your tools away when you're not using them. And that's probably a good idea for someone like myself who's not a full-time woodworker. I still have to work my day job. So I don't really know what the best solution is, but I'm gonna have fun trying to figure it out. As you can see in the garage here, I have French cleats on most of the walls here, and I have a ton of tools that I still need to put up on French cleats. Now, all of my festival tools, they're gonna stay in their sustainers. I'm not gonna be probably putting those up on the wall and display like the other ones. However, my Ryobi kit, I leave those out so that my wife can use them whenever she wants to. Now, there's a lot of tools that I've purchased that I'm not 100% sure what I'm gonna do with in the long run. This bandsaw is great. It gives me the ability to you know, cut some pretty heavy duty stuff. However, I would like for it to actually have a fence. Now, I've been thinking about making one on my own and I may do that at least for the short term, but one of the things, one of the things that I realized is it would be very helpful to have resawing capacity here in the shop because as I'm still growing in my skill set, it would be beneficial for me to be able to use like basically construction lumber to build all my little ideas in my head. That way I'm not out of a lot of money. Then if I actually get good and I decide I want to use the more expensive woods, I can do that. However, we know that construction lumber doesn't really come looking that nice. So you kind of got to mill it up. And that's why I actually, that's why I ended up purchasing the, jo uh, the jointer that I have here. Now I wanted to go with the longer bed jointer, but it had the one that I wanted that had the helical head. It actually was like almost $2,400. And as you can see, it's already kind of tight in here. And so it would have been a difficult purchase to, to justify. And a lot of things may have to go if I wanted to upgrade to that. And regardless, it was only a 110 volt. So being 110 volt, that meant it was only a six inch joiner as well. With this particular model, I got an eight inch joiner. It's small and compact and you know, it helps me on smaller projects and I can learn how to join before I invest as much money as it would cost to get a bigger one. So this is the router table that I have. 
it's just a Ryobi and I do have a Ryobi router underneath here. I actually did buy one of those Jessum router lifts a while ago and I was actually going to put it in my MFT table. However, when I got it, it came damaged. And so I actually sent it back to the store because I didn't want to pay that kind of money for something that's damaged. Later on, I started looking into getting one of those really nice router tables with all the little bells and whistles just because I felt like it may make the job a little bit easier for me. But that's kind of falling by the wayside because basically, you know, there were other things that I was interested in doing and yeah. Over here I've got my Ryobi bandsaw that I bought a long time ago. Uh, I still use it. I have a smaller blade on here for like more curvy type cuts and that is definitely something that's probably going to end up going unless of course when I get into showing my daughters a little bit more about how to, you know, do some basic cuts and stuff, I may let them use this. We'll see. As you can see here, this is my little drill station. It's the first one that I ever made and I have way more drills now so I'm going to have to do something different with this. Down here I have my mechanics tools. I have uh, the impact wrenches here and some ratchets over there. These things are lifesavers when I'm working on my car. If you look up there to the top, I actually have one of those cutoff wheels, the Milwaukee Fuel. Now, I don't really have a reason to have a saw like that. However, the reason why I did buy it was because when I bought my Milwaukee M18 miter saw and also my table saw, I bought them together as a bundle for about a thousand dollars and it didn't come with batteries. That particular set, I got it on sale for $5.99 and it came with two 12 amp hour batteries. And if you look online now, the 12 amp hour batteries are about $250 or $260 a piece. So, Basically, I got that saw for $99. I prefer to buy my tools that way. I was actually considering getting the Milwaukee lawnmower because it comes with two more, MA, uh, two more 12 amp hour batteries. However, I think I'm going to probably decide against that. Now, the reason why I'm gonna decide against that is because I've been running this Ego lawnmower for like, I'm thinking like eight or nine years now. It's been a long time. I had this when I was living in Oakland and this is just a regular push mower, and the only thing I have issues with is one of these little green clamps right here. They don't stay closed, so I have to put tape over it to keep it closed or else the lawnmower will cut off, but it's still running fine. Um, I have a bunch of Ego tools, and one of the things, well, I was actually considering, when I had to do the fence post for the fence, I was actually looking at getting a auger. And I ended up not getting an auger and just buying one of those little hand shovel things to dig things out. But an auger would have been a lot easier on the body. And I just saw the Ego is actually going to be releasing a battery powered auger. And they're also going to be releasing a battery powered sprayer. Now, I have a gas sprayer and I also have a battery powered sprayer. I know lots of things are changing. And so eventually we won't be able to have probably gas sprayers. So... I think Ego is right on time by coming out with a battery power sprayer, which would help me to utilize all the rest of my Ego equipment and keep everything in the same family. That'd be super convenient. So basically, I'm kind of married to Ego, at least at this time. That's why I didn't go with the Milwaukee. Well, two reasons. One is the fact that now I can get a battery powered sprayer potentially if it comes out and it actually meets uh, specifications to be able to wash my car and, and to do the little things that I use my power sprayer for. But then the other thing is I have not tried the new uh, Ego lawnmower, the one with the line IQ. However, I've heard that it has some kind of jerking going on, so I'm not interested in that. But or not line IQ, speed IQ, sorry. I'm combining things. The speed IQ on the more basically it's whatever reason they say is jerky and so it seems like it's first gen of that i don't think it's necessarily worth doing on the flip side of that coin the line iq on the actual trimmer i find it good now i do feel like i go through more string when i use it but i like the fact that i don't have to bump it anymore to use it so that and before you know milwaukee came out with their tiller and all of these different things you know it was something that i was considering is moving over to milwaukee but that's not going to happen now, I do have a Ryobi tiller, and the reason why I have that is because before Ego actually produced their tiller, Ryobi had came out with one, and when I was tearing up the lawn to try to get the grass to grow, I wanted the tiller because I didn't want to, you know, 
basically I'm getting older and I don't have the strength that I used to have or the energy that I used to have. So I use the Ryobi Tiller, but then when Ego came out, I already had a power head and they came out with the head. I went ahead and upgraded and got that head for my Ego. So I still haven't gotten rid of the Ryobi. It runs on the 40 volt system. However, you know, I've actually used both. I've actually, when I was actually tearing up the backyard, I, I actually pulled one out until the battery ran out and then I pulled the other one out and used this, that one. Now, I only have one 40 volt battery and I actually was using it also with a 40 volt lawn leaf vacuum. And I actually kind of like that leaf vacuum. However, I had it sitting on a table and it fell off and it broke. And so I need to try to open it up and see if I can repair it. If I can, then great. But if not, then that'll be another reason why I should just get rid of that 40 volt battery. So I'm gonna wrap this video up right here. And this part of the video, I just basically wanna talk about, this is where I started. You can look here, look up here on the wall and you see a whole bunch of Ryobi tools. This is how I found out that this was something that I wanted to do with my free time and something that I wanted to grow in. Now, Now I'm buying higher end tools like this and trying them out to see which ones I think are best for me. But where I start, this is not where I started. I started out with the Ryobi. My skills still don't meet these tools. However, there are things that I wanted to do or wanted to use when I purchased uh, these particular things. Stuff like parallel guides, which give you a square cut. Stuff like uh, angle squares that you can use on the rail. And you know, if you look at, if you do your research, you'll find out well, Ryobi, both Ryobi, um, Milwaukee, and Rigid, they just recently came out with track saws. So when I decided that I wanted to get a track saw because I wanted to be able to cut down four by eight sheets of plywood because oftentimes when I would go to the, to the Home Depot or any of these big box stores, there would always be no one available to cut the wood down. So being that I'm trying to manage a big four by eight sheet of plywood by myself, a job side table saw is just not going to cut it. So basically I went ahead and I invested in a track saw and the first track saw that I got was the cheapest one that for me, which was the DeWalt at the time. Now I ended up learning later because my research was not as thorough as it needed to be that at that time, DeWalt did not support parallel guides. It did not support angle, uh, right angle squares or anything like that. And so uh, I ended up learning later after I got really comfortable with the DeWalt track saw, I got comfortable with it. And that's when I moved over and bought my Makita. And I bought the Makita doing the same thing that I did with the DeWalt. I just went with the cheaper option. So now, you know, going with DeWalt, I can't say it's a bad thing because, you know, you've got the flex fault. You've got a table saw, you've got a miter saw, you've got all kinds of different tools that you can use with both the regular 20 volt and the flex volt battery. Now, those two systems aren't integrated or they don't really overlap. You can use the flex volt battery on a drill, but you can't use a 20 volt battery in this table saw. But now there's a company called benchdogs.co.uk. They've been around for a while and I bought a few products from them. One of them being my rail hinge system. They have now developed a, well, first and foremost, their hinge system works with the DeWalt track saw. So you can do that check. And then they've also developed a parallel guide and also a right uh, angle square for your rail. Now you do have to remove either some or all of the, one of the cutoff strips on the DeWalt rail, but that's an option if you wanted to go that route. Now, I, to me, when I looked online, the DeWalt saw is not as cheap as it, you know, it, it used to be in comparison. I think the Makita may actually be the cheapest one if you don't go with the 40 volt. So after going with the Makita track saw for a while and using the parallel guides and the angle squares, both by TSO, I was, you know, I was hooked, I thought it was great. But then as you start to use a track saw, I don't know if it's true for everybody, but then you start to think about something like this, which is an MFT table. And Makita doesn't make an MFT table. So I wanted to get one of these and it just felt kind of weird to pair this with my Makita track saw. Now I know many people have done it. So that's how I ended up ultimately getting into the Festool system. I well prior to that I had bought the Domino but I was kind of looking at that as an outlier something totally separate but with this it, it just felt you know right to get the Festool track saw with it so around when I bought this I actually bought the Festool TS 
55 KEB. Right after I bought that, I just happened to see somebody on Craigslist selling Festool tools, one of them being this drill and the other one, the REB, and it was a good price. So I went ahead and picked them up. Now, of course, I didn't need to buy those track saws, but, or the track saw and the drill, but you know, it was nice. And I think I had already bought the CSX drill because basically I, there was a lot of research that I had heard about and people were already saying, were always saying that the CSX was great. And I did find it to be quite an improvement over my Dewalt and my Milwaukee tools. Now that Bosch though is a close second. So anyways, guys, I'm just rambling here. I hope maybe you enjoy a video like this. I, uh, Obviously, as you can see, I'm enjoying my time with my tools, tinkering and doing whatever. One of the things that I plan on doing is redoing all of the French, uh, not the French cleats, but all of my tool holders in this garage. And the whole reason for that is not that tool holders need to be so great or fancy, but I feel like this will be, you know, one of the criti criticisms that I get a lot on uh, YouTube is, you know, basically having basically low skills. And so that'll give me some time to really focus on some of the joinery techniques and some of the, you know, just learning my tools a little bit better. I haven't forgotten about tools like my Lamello and the actual Mafel Dual Dowler. Um, I wanted, let me just confess here, when I bought my Dominoes, the one thing I didn't realize, and this is something you should know if you're gonna get a Domino, you need clamps. I bought my Domino's, didn't have clamps. I don't have many clamps now. And that was, you know, um, I actually had like $1,000 worth of clamps in my cart one time and I basically, you know, couldn't pull the trigger because it just seemed like a lot of money for clamps. But you need clamps if you're going to use the Domino because you have to be able to hold I those joints. I didn't get that. Could you try again? You see, technology. Recording every word I'm saying. But anyways, you need clamps if you're gonna use a domino, and that's something that I didn't know, but if you're gonna get a domino, get some clamps. Now, with the Lamello, you have the option of using those self-clamping things, and they seem to be pretty cool, but they are pretty expensive for what they are. Now, the actual Mafel Dual Dowler, that, so, I'm trying to find the actual metric dowels. I'm not having a great, I've, I haven't sourced any places where I can get them. So I'm looking at the Veritas Dowel Maker, which has like been out of stock for forever. It's like the master system is like $400. And every time I look it up, it's on back order. So I may end up getting one of those, but they actually only make, uh, it makes Imperial dowels. So I have to find out if that works because if I can't find metric dowels for the dual dowler, you know, I don't think they make, I'll have to go back and look and see if they make um, imperial bits, but I think most of the bits are metric. So I don't know if there's gonna be too much variation between metric and imperial crossing the two, but I bought them a failed dual dowler because when I'm using or learning joinery and doing those things, they're, they're just quite frankly cheaper than using a domino. So it's kind of similar theory, but cheaper. Okay. All right, guys, my camera's about to overheat, so I'm going to stop my video here. I just want to thank each and every one of you that takes the time to watch even a second of my video. It's, you know, it's, I'm grateful. You didn't have to do it, so I appreciate it. Uh, I will be getting that TSV60 up and running here before the end of the week. And uh, yeah, I, then we'll start basically building some new French cleats or French cleat holders for tools. One of my cameras overheated already and it just shut down on me. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this video up here. Luckily, this one's overheating too. I just jumped in front of it. So the audio may be a little bit different. Thanks guys for taking time to watch the video and I'll see you in my next one.